Uh, welcome to my session. Um, we are starting, I think. It's uh, 6.15 in Germany. Um, I try not to get distracted too much from the chat, which is going on at the same time. Um, I have a presentation about code quality with Magenta 2. And let me first introduce myself. Um, so, my name is Andreas von Stuttnitz. I'm from Germany. Uh, I am a co-founder and uh, managing director, but also a backend developer at Integernet. And I still love my backend development, so uh, I won't give that up. Um, I started quite a few years ago, and I'm still happy with with my choice of uh, doing Magento only. And uh, well, um, it's not my first talk, but it's my first remote talk. And uh, perhaps a few people know me from Meet Magento Poland, Meet Magento Germany, Meet Magento Netherlands, uh, and or other conferences. So what I'm talking about, I'm talking about quality, code quality in Magento, and uh, just an example on how much that topic has evolved. Uh, we, I searched for Magento quality in Google in 2014, and uh, you see the results I got, they don't have anything to do with code quality or um, yeah, other, other types of quality besides image quality. So code quality was not really a topic in 2014. And luckily, in 2020, it has changed. So if I search for magenta quality, I did that a few weeks ago, um, I get results about the extension quality program. I get results about uh, yeah quality in general and so on. So um, it's a topic which has gained, uh, received some uh, attendance, and I'm happy with that, but there's still a lot to do, and probably not everyone is on the same level. Um, I'll try to share my experience with code quality and improving code quality today. So this is the agenda. Um, I'll start with a little bit of motivation. So why code quality is important. Then I'll have a short um, introduction of general code quality, but the main part is about Magento specific and especially Magento 2 specific code quality. Um, I'll share some tools for code quality, for improving code quality. And then in the end, uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, uh, depending on when I finish my presentation. So um, for, for some motivation, what is code quality good for? On the one hand, we have the code quality for customers. Uh, and customers are merchants in this case, um, and our merchants profit from code quality uh, with uh, experience fewer bugs, for example. So if you have better code quality, fewer bugs is one result, but also you have more reliable code in general. It's better extensible, you will you'll create fewer uh, fewer errors, and in general, you'll have a more reliable uh, yeah, website. Uh, then code quality is good for security. I think it's obvious why uh, merchants profit from good security. So if you have good quality, you will you'll spot uh, possible flaws in your, in your code. Um, then you'll have better updatability, and this leads to less expensive costs in the long term. So um, better code means lower cost. Um, and the reason for that is, on the one hand, it's better updatable, it's less effort to update code or update Magento to new versions because your code will uh, be less error prone on updates. But on the other hand, it's easier to extend your code. Extend your code and to extend or adapt your code, you have to understand it. And in many cases, there's not only one developer on a project, uh, but two or three or four. And uh, if the second developer tries to extend the code, which the first developer has written, um, then he has to understand it. And uh, better code, 
is easier to read. That's one of the main purposes of code quality, more readable code. And then even for myself, if I see my code from half a year ago, it's more or less like uh, I, I've forgotten most of the details and I need to uh, get into the code again and I have to read it and understand it again. Uh, and only when I understood it, uh, only then I can make uh, my extensions or adaptions. So about general code quality, let's start with the soft factors. Um, and the most important point uh, to increase uh, code reviews uh, is to do code reviews. And it's not only code reviews for, for junior developers, but code reviews for everyone. When I started uh, my first Magento 2 project in 2016, um, I got into a team where code reviews uh, were done and that was a great experience. And uh, not only my code was uh, reviewed, but also the code of other senior developers and junior developers. And in every code review, um, something was found. Some issue, sometimes it's just a small naming issue. Um, like uh, this variable is confusing or this class could could better be at that place. But sometimes you spot some serious bugs or um, some security flaws and uh, all those things make your code better. And uh, even junior developers who started with Magento two months ago um, can spot some of the flaws in senior developers codes and nobody's code is perfect. Um, then what I think is a very important point to good code quality is uh, you shouldn't work too much. If you work 14 hours a day on your code, you don't see the weak spots in your code. You don't uh, see what is uh, what, what you might improve. So I really prefer coding for, let's say, five or six hours a day. Um, there's always other stuff to do, um, like doing code reviews or writing stuff or answering emails or whatever uh, to fill up my working hours uh, with useful stuff. Um, but I, in my experience, you can't be really concentrated for more than five or six hours a day. Then uh, one good idea is pair programming if you have the possibility. So one is doing the actual coding and the other is consulting and looking into what the uh, first uh, developer is writing and uh, giving hints and looking things up and so on. And it really uh, speeds things up on the one hand and on the other hand, it improves code quality a lot uh, because you get to discuss your code directly. Uh, I've made very good experience with it. Uh, it's not possible always, and it doesn't make sense for uh, some easier coding, but for uh, really intense coding sessions, it makes total sense to do pair programming if you have the possibility. And even if you are alone in a project, if you're a single freelancer or working at a merchant as the only developer, um, you can still ask around on Slack, ask around on Twitter if someone wants to do pair programming with you. Um, and you might find someone. someone. And the same goes, um, by the way, for code reviews. So if you don't have anyone to do code reviews um, for you, ask around. And I'm pretty sure um, there will be someone who can do your code reviews. And uh, on the other hand, you can do his or her code reviews. And as I think is really important, you should do code reviews to improve your code. So um, then it's about good code is about simple code. Um, and I think that's really important. There are some very clever developers, um, but they write code, which is really hard to understand. Uh, and I really prefer code which is easy to understand. And that isn't always uh, the case if you have a lot of abstraction um, and if, if you have some bad coding styles which, which are very clever but uh, show that which, which make your code more complex. Uh, for example, you, um, yeah, you should reduce the number of lines of code 
uh, for the demand. Uh, you should use existing functions, um, so don't write everything yourself. Uh, otherwise, the risk of breaking something on the next Magento update is much higher than if you use core features, which are um, which are more or less reliable. Um, and there's a quote I really like uh, about that thing. Debugging is twice as hard as writing the code in the first place. Therefore, if you write the code as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to debug it. And especially not uh, smart enough in half a year uh, because it's harder to get into your code again. I made the experience myself uh, and sometimes I noticed uh, if I used virtual classes or a lot of abstractions and it was really hard to understand that code again. It might seem obvious when you're developing it, but think about yourself in half a year or you're uh, the next developer uh, who has to go, has to work with that code. Don't write it as clever as possible, but write it as simple as possible. And one book which really helped me with uh, um, with understanding good code um, is uh, the refactoring book by Martin Fowler. It's a few years old, but it's still valid and it still uh, brings good insights into, into code quality. So that's it about generic code quality. Let's continue with the Magento specific code quality. I have a few things to, that, to say about that and there are some topics which are uh, very dear to me. Um, let's start with some more generic things uh, about updatability. I think that uh, mass that is, is clear to, to quite a few of you. You shouldn't do any core hacks. I think Ben Marx is not here, um, but he would uh, confirm. Um, no core hacks, no hacks of external modules. Otherwise, you won't be able to update them again. Um, instead of doing direct changes to PHP classes, you can use observers, you can use plugins, you can use preferences. Uh, instead of changing template files, make copy of the template files, or better, use layout XML to inject some new template files um, on appropriate places where, po places where possible. Don't do changes on uh, given language files. Uh, instead, you can create your own language pack which is not as hard as it used to be in Magento one times, but it's quite easy to have your own language pack per project. Um, and it totally makes sense. Then one uh, thing which is relatively new um, is uh, view models. Um, in traditional Magento, we had the model view controller uh, paradigm uh, where we use blocks for views. And if we want to, ex extend a template file and need some more information in that template file, uh, some class uh, method call, uh, whatever, we needed to extend the block. And extending the block is generally not a good idea because it's because it has some dependencies on its own. And usually they are quite big and hard to extend uh, working with protected or private method. And it's much more clear to uh, use separate classes for uh, every data you need in your template files. And for that, that you have view models. A view model is just like a model, but for a view, for a template in this case. Uh, they don't inherit everything, anything, which is the most important thing here. Um, they don't need to implement anything. They don't need to have dependencies, but they can. Uh, there's a full blog post about it uh, by my colleague Fabian. Um, you can find it on our website. Let me show you a little example about that. Um, let's say I want to extend the breadcrumbs PHTML file um, with some additional functionality whatever it is. And then I can go create my own uh, layout file. It's a catalog product view XML, which can be in my own theme or in my own module. And in that file, we can uh, define a view model. 
And by that, uh, uh, this is a case from the core, but we can also use a reference block to, to an existing uh, block and add an argument. And in this case, the argument is named view model, and you can inject a class by that. And the class, uh, sorry, the, the, the te uh, template file, it includes the view model with the call block get data of view model. This name view model is the same as the name in the argument. And with this, you can add any uh, view model to any PHTML file without having to extend the block. It leads to much clearer code and it leads to much simpler extending of PHTML files. Um, one other important topic is configuration as code. Configuration as code, um, well, you can configure everything in the Magento backend. You can do uh, go to store configuration and set your uh, set your currency and define your theme and uh, define your payment methods and so on. So you can create, do everything in the uh, admin area, but that's usually not the best idea. And the reason for that is uh, that other people might mess with your settings. So for example, if the merchant has access to, um, to, to the admin area or a fellow developer, a colleague of you, which isn't informed about what you're doing, um, he or she can change anything and uh, overwrite your settings and uh, you can have some conflicts, your code isn't working anymore. Uh, whatever, it gets worse when you're working with more than one um, environment. So for example, you have a live environment, you have a staging environment, you have developer machines, and uh, you set your setting on the development machine, you set the same setting on the stage staging machine uh, when you deployed your code to that for testing, but you can forget to set it on the live uh, server. Um, and for that, there, there are some quite cool mechanisms in Magento. Uh, there have been some tools for that in older Magento versions as well, like 1.x or 2.1. Um, but it, since 2.2.4, it has improved a lot because you can set everything in the uh, config PHP and ENV PHP. Those files are in the app etc directory. Um, and uh, you can set every configuration settings with a simple um, with a simple command line command. In this case, it's bin magento config set. Then you have a parameter. Uh, so sorry, you have an argument. Uh, the first argument is a path of your configuration settings. The second argument is a value. If you do it without that option log config or log env, you write it to the database and you haven't gained anything. But you, if you add, add one of those parameters, you'll lock this configuration settings and that means you have it in your code, in your config PHP or in your env PHP. So it gets added automatically. And one big advantage of that, if you go to the admin area after that, uh, you cannot change the value anymore. There's no option for it. It is, it's scraped out and you have no option to, uh, to change the setting anymore. That makes things much more reliable. You can also create your websites and stores and store groups with that. There's, um, uh, there's an area in the config PHP I'll show you in a minute and you can set store specific values if you want to enable a, a payment method only in one store, um, you can do it. So this is one example from one of our projects. On the left, uh, this is a normal store configuration. We can set a theme ID. You can set, uh, if you want to use three whites, if you, you can set your cookie lifetime, the default country, time zone, and so on and so on. On the right, we have another section of the config PHP where you can define your websites and groups and stores. And this is a configuration with uh, four websites, one admin website, base websites, uh, one German and one Austrian 
website and um, it gets executed automatically on setup upgrade. So the difference between those two files, the config PHP is for sharing. So that gets added to your uh, Git. Um, and the env php doesn't uh, isn't added to your git so you can uh, have uh, environment specific things in the env php and global settings uh, which are valid for all um, environments in the config php um, you shouldn't add everything, every config setting in config PHP. Um, one reason it, it gets very um, confusing. I've seen that in one project and um, it's, it's a very long list of configuration settings and not so easy to find your things anymore. Uh, on the other hand, it might make sense to leave some of the settings open. So there's no reason to lock the email addresses because if the customer wants to have another email address as a a recipient for his contact form, he can do it, why not? Um, but it's for the most important things like, as I said, uh, payment methods, or if you want to uh, have merging activated or not, uh, things like that, um, which are critical to your code working nicely, uh, are should be kept in your config PHP. The env.php is uh, ideal for your base URLs, for example, which are different on the staging system than on the live system. Um, it's perfect for disabling some features which shouldn't be on the staging system or disabling uh, other features which shouldn't be on live system or for uh, changing your um, access data, your AP. API data, um, which might differ between the live system and the staging system. Then we have setup patches. Um, experienced developers will at least know the old setup scripts for Magento 1 and Magento 2 up to 2.2. They are still working, by the way, um, where you have a file for each version in Magento 1, or you have a really long file in some cases which where you have to define your uh, settings per version. Um, in Magento 2.3 upwards, you have setup patches, which are much nicer, I think. Um, you can use them for configuration as code as well. They can cover everything which is not just pure settings or website and store configuration. Uh, but everything which is in the database. It can be CMS pages, it can be product attributes, it can be creating new categories or whatever, which are which should be active on every, um, every system. Um, and I use it, for example, for, for configurator product, which is based for, for a feature uh, I developed, and it makes sense to have the same setting for that on, on every machine. And it makes deployment much easier because you don't have to create that product, assign it to websites, set the uh, stock inventory data, and so on and so on. But you just deploy the code, call setup upgrade, as you would do anyways, and then you have everything in place. Um, yeah, just let me just show an example of that. That's the setup patch um, you added in a certain directory in the setup patch data directory. You can add any class in that and the naming doesn't matter. All classes in that directory will be, will be executed if they implement the right interface. Um, we have the apply functionality in which we can do what we actually want to do. For example, adding a product attribute in this case. Um, and in order to define a sort order, you can have, we have the get dependencies function. So we might need to, uh, de to execute our setup patches in a certain sort order. Then we can define dependencies. And with this dependency, for example, I can make sure that the create availability attributes class is executed before my create model attribute class. You can assemble quite a few um, 
set up patches in, in one module, for example, I tend to have one product attributes uh, module in, in the project. Uh, and in an evolving project, you might have 10 or 20 classes in that, but that's not a problem um, as long as you take care of the dependencies. Sorry, of the dependencies uh, functionality. So, a little bit about tools for code quality. Um, I can't go too deeply into that as my time is slowly running out. Uh, one important tool about better code quality is automated testing. Everyone does a, doesn't do enough of automated testing, I think, and that includes me. Uh, but still in Magento 2, automated testing is much easier in general than in Magento 1. Uh, I tried to do some integration testing in Magento 1. There was a great tool by Ivan Ciproni uh, using PHP unit, um, but it wasn't so easy to use if you uh, got into, the, into depth. And in Magento 2, um, automated testing is uh, provided by the core. Uh, the core is covered with automated tests, unit tests, integration tests, and front-end tests. And uh, also there's a testing framework for each of these um, test method, methods. And now it's much easier to use it. And uh, just as an example, I tried my first integration test with Magento 2 and I got it set up and running and writing my first really simple test um, in about two or three hours. So it's really not hard to get into the, into the first steps of it. Um, you just need to do it um, once, try it out, um, and uh, the first tests are not so hard. Of course, there are some uh, some parts where it can get more difficult um, and to write really good and well-structured tests uh, is, a, um, is a, yeah, it's, it's a skill set here on its own. Um, let me just show you one part of, of an integration test. That I think that was the one the first integration test I wrote. Uh, it's an excerpt of that. And uh, this is one, one class. It extends a test framework class. In this case, it's an abstract controller, which is being used to call Magento pages. It simulates it only, but it still does it. So let's look into the test class itself. As it starts with test, it gets executed during automated tests. And what it does, it dispatches a category page. So there's a controller called simulated, um, which is used to receive the HTML uh, on category number three. And this category number three has been created before in this uh, load fixture functionality. There's a PHP file which includes the creating of categories. It's just uh, some Magento code. You can look it up. There's a blog post about that on the IntegerNet site as well. Uh, I can share uh, the link to it. I thought I had it on this page, but I haven't. Um, I can share this. Um, so this is some code which just creates a category, which creates some products. And based on that, the test makes an assertion. It tests if that HTML we receive contains the text simple product one. And it checks if it does not contain simple product two. And if both of, the, of those assertions are fine, um, the test passes. This is just one test, but it can also show you um, if the right products uh, are being shown uh, yeah, in, uh, on your category. Uh, the database changes we are doing here, here, they are rolled back after the test. So it's all being done in a, um, in, in a temporary modification of the database. Um, and there are static tests. Um, well, uh, to go back to the integration test for uh, one more sentence, uh, you can, of course, you can execute them on your own to make sure you don't change, you, you haven't changed any existing functionality with your new code. 
or even better, you can include it in your deployment process. So it gets uh, executed automatically whenever you do a, a merge request or whatever. Thanks, Sergey. Uh, that's the link to, to the blog post. Um, about static tests, it's a different type of test and it just tests uh, the metrics of your code. So for example, if your code is formatted well regarding the uh, some metrics, regarding some rules, um, which are defined somewhere. Um, for example, if you don't have several blank lines, for example, if your uh, methods aren't too long and for that, I'll have to fast forward a little bit now. I like to use a few tools. There's code sniffer for those metrics. There's the mess detector for uh, more metrics. And then there's Grum PHP to automate it. And uh, this is what Grum PHP uh, does. If you commit uh, your code, it checks um, with some tools. For example, it checks the code sniffer, it checks uh, the mess detector and everything uh, is accepted, you get a green face. And if something doesn't go well, because you have uh, long, a line which is longer than 120 chars, you get a red face, a grumpy face, and you get an error message which shows you uh, which code you have to improve. And it's not too hard to set up. I've listed um, the uh, I've listed the commands to install it in your project here. Uh, I'll share, uh, share that code after that and share the slides after that, of course. And you see it's three or four composer calls and then you have this setups and one more file, it's the grumphp.yaml in your root directory, which activates uh, the PHP code sniffer standards and the PHP mess detector standards, which are delivered with Magento. So you don't have to invent those standards yourself, uh, but you can use the default Magento standards. Finishing up with the obvious, which should be obvious, but in some cases it isn't. Please use the source code management tool like Git. Please use Composer for managing dependencies and external modules and don't include your uh, code directly into app code if it's not your own code, if it's not project specific. Anything else should be included via Composer and managed via Composer. It makes uh, things much more reliable. And then use a good uh, IDE like PHP Storm, uh, where you can see warnings and errors directly. Uh, it gives you a hint if something goes wrong. You can have uh, small refactorings like extract a method or extract a variable, uh, which makes it much less error prone to refactor things. And you can quite easily integrate tools like code sniffer and mess detector with your rules. So you don't see it when you commit, but before. Uh, if you made the mistakes. So that's it. I'll open up the questions and answers now. You can ask them in, in, the, uh, in the chat, but I'd prefer to, uh, if you would ask your questions uh, in person uh, with, your, with your camera or without your camera, with your voice, um, just requests uh, for voice sharing and I'm happy to try to answer. Your questions. Thank you. I see Sergey has already shared the link to the blog post. I will share um, my uh, I will share my slides. I'm not sure if uh, this tool uh, allows to share slides. I'll post them on Twitter and I'll post them on SlideShare. Um, so, uh, Alexei has some questions. How often do you write tests and do you use TDD? I think I'm not advanced enough in, uh, in testing. As I said, it's a skill set of its own and I'm, let's say, medium level with that. Uh, my colleague Fabian is on a much higher level than I am. Um, I never really got into it. I, I think it really makes sense to do it, but uh, it takes some effort to get 
there and I never found the time to get into TDD up to now and so I'm not doing it. I usually write tests after my code and to answer your uh, other question, I try to write integration tests for um, for most of my important code. I don't write cas tests, for example, for creating new attributes, but I do for, let's say, uh, import processes. In a recent project, I have uh, import process with uh, images and category assignments and so on. And um, I have an XML file as a fixture, and then I import it in my tests, and then I check if the products have been created and if the attributes have the right value and so on and so on. I do it for, uh, depending on the project, for about, let's say, 50% of my code. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Okay, uh, Roman has a question. Uh, did you use updated module of Magento for PHP Storm? I did, but I think I didn't use many of those features. I really liked that module. Uh, which helps to find uh, connections between uh, classes, for example, plugins for, for a class, which really helps. Um, I tried the new functionality to create plugin. Um, so, for example, you can uh, go to a core class, which you want to plug into, uh, and you do a right click on the class name, and then you have the option to create a plugin, and then a window pops up where you can define in which module that plugin should be created and how the plugin should be named. And, uh, that works really nicely, and I really like that. So, uh, that's a good recommendation to use the official Magento plugin for PHP Storm, and one of the best reasons to use PHP Storm instead of uh, another. Tool. It's more or less like um, the old Magento and Magento one times. Um, Evgen is asking, do you try to use PHP stem for static analysts? No, I didn't try that. Uh, I'm quite happy with the one PHP, but I know there are other tools. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure uh, it, it, it's, yeah, there are better tools than Grum PHP with uh, PHP CS and PHP uh, mess detector, but I'm quite happy with it. And I think using any tool is much, much better than using no tool. Okay, Thomas is asking, do you follow Magento 2 coding standards or use your own? Like Magento 2 uses PSR 2, which act actually is already replaced by PSR 12. Um, in fact, I'm not totally sure. I'm pretty pretty sure that I'm using the official Magento 2 standards, but in the last two projects, um, I've worked in someone else's setup, uh, the coding standards, and so, and I'm just using it, so I'm not totally sure. I can look it up. So, any more questions? We have six minutes left. So Dimitra asks, what do you think about using SensioLab Security Checker as part of CI for commercial projects? Do you treat it as safe? I haven't used that for now, but in my opinion, it makes sense to, to use an external security solution. Um, we use the solution, um, what, it's, what is it named by um, Willem de Hoot? Um, just forgot this. Uh, Sensec, um, which we are running on all our servers, um, which checks uh, for known security flaws and uh, sus suspicious code and suspicious parts in your database, and we rely on that pretty much. So, any more questions? 
I'll be around. Ah, there's one, Sumit. Uh, what is your idea to co go completely headless for Magento? Will it decline the popularity of Magento in the future? That has nothing to do with code quality, but I'm happy to answer it um, nevertheless, um, because we are just doing uh, to headless projects at this time. None of that is um, has went live yet, but it should. They both should go live in like two months. Um, we are using Vue Storefront at the moment. Um, I think it is a good idea, but the tools which are available yet still lack some functionality and stability. So um, I don't think there's anything more advanced than Vue Storefront at the moment, um, but still we have a lot of work to uh, integrate our features uh, with that. And uh, it makes a lot of effort and uh, we need to go some, do some workarounds. And, uh, it only makes sense, in my opinion, at the moment for, for the bigger projects, which has the budget to uh, put a couple developers on a project and uh, to pay, pay them. And um, it is a lot of effort and you need to do a lot of work and it's not really, really stable yet. Uh, but I still think, think it's the future. So. Um, Well, I said that last year, but uh, let's wait one more year and uh, uh, the tools, especially PWA Studio will become much more stable in my opinion, uh, then it makes more sense. Uh, but I think it will never be uh, um, a thing for for a majority of the Magento shops. Great, moving over soon. I still have one minute. I try to also answer the last two questions. Uh, first, Alexander. Won't code review slow down the, down the whole process of code delivery? Yes, a little bit, it will, but it pays off totally. And you need to include it in your process. So for example, we have the rule to uh, do code reviews if some code review is assigned to you at latest on the next morning. So it slows down less than a day and that's usually acceptable. Of course, if it goes uh, there and back a couple of times, it can slow down more, but it pays off, it really pays off. And once you get accustomed to it, you, you'll notice yourself. Then Sebastian is asking about how do you, do you check XML error, errors? Well, PHP Storm has a feature built in and I think every IDE to check uh, XML syntax based on the, um, based on the uh, syntax files, forgot how they are named, but um, as well the Magento uh, PHP Storm plugin has a possibility to, do, to generate the mapping to those files. You can set up them manually or uh, the bin Magento command. You can uh, set up your connections as well. Uh, and once you have set up those connections um, with the, uh, um, yeah, with the XSL files, um, you will have an automatic code correction and code autocompletion. XSL T, yes, that's it. Thanks. Ah, yeah. Okay, I hope that answers it. Uh, I'll try to uh, look it up if I can find a good explanation uh, about that. Thanks for the questions. Okay, let's move on.